So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the August meeting of the SJAA Obser uh, uh, Imagers. And uh, tonight we have John Hayes uh, going to talk to us about a remote telescope in Chile. Uh, John's been an optical professional, should I say? Is that the right word for his whole career? An expert in optics and uh, has turned into an astrophotographer, or reverted from his original uh, film days to a modern astrophotographer and is an expert on, on all sorts of stuff that we're gonna hear about. So uh, since you can read John's full bio on the meetup page and take it away, John. Please. Okay, well, thank you, hi. I'm gonna go ahead and we'll see if we can get the screen sharing going here and uh, see if we can, uh, can you guys see that there? Yes. There we go. Okay, well, good. Right. Well, I wanted to thank you guys for inviting me to do this. You know, I love talking about imaging telescopes. And as an optical engineer, you know, this is, there's nothing more fun to me than building telescopes. And for me, you know, a lot of people image and, and, and enjoy it. I was, I was talking to one of my buddies uh, uh, the other day, and, you know, he says, I've never even seen one of the telescopes I own. I have them shipped out to a remote observatory. All I care is about the data. And for me, half of the fun is the telescope. So uh, this is a, 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 the story of this 20-inch uh, uh, telescope that I configured, uh, I bought and configured uh, during the pandemic. And uh, uh, we'll tell you the whole story here. Uh, let's see if we can, oops. Let's uh, just take me a second here, laser pointer. I'm gonna get a laser pointer going. And there we go. And I should be, oh, there we go. So let's just a little quick overview of what we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, the motivation, you know, why get a bigger telescope? Uh, talk about some of the system design goals, you know, what drove the way I did things uh, and look at the optical design of this telescope and uh, go over uh, what I did to design the instrument package to optimize the imaging camera, uh, what I'm going to do for guiding and focusing, and then how I went about uh, evaluating the performance of this thing. And uh, I did some interesting things, uh, some of them old, older technology, some of them newer technology. And um, we'll go over uh, flat correction, image calibration, vignetting and baffling, how it worked in this. And then sort of the problem solving part of this, you know, nothing <laughs> often in engineering projects, it doesn't always go the way you planned. And uh, you, you reach a point where you have to solve problems. And that was uh, no exception here. I haven't had an eyepiece on a telescope for a long time. And so I am, uh, I am purely uh, an imager and I'm glad to hear that most of you guys are as well. So you know that, that this is a big subject. Uh, so we're gonna go over a few of the things but we're gonna miss a lot of it, but we'll talk about the relevant stuff, uh, the stuff that's relevant to this, this story. Uh, and I wanted to start out with the current telescope that I image with uh, because that's gonna ultimately serve as our reference system. Uh, I use a 14 inch uh, flat field uh, SCT. It's, a, it's an edge HD system. It's highly modified. This is not a standard uh, factory system. Uh, of course, you guys know it's a Schmidt Cassegrain that has, an, has a, a built in field flattener. Uh, the focal length is just shy of about uh, four meters, operating at F10.8. I have a 16803 uh, cooled camera on it, which is, of course, a monochrome camera. Uh, nine micron pixels. Uh, this telescope is, the, the Celestron only specs these to cover 52 millimeters, uh, uh, 52 millimeter imaging, imaging circle, but they work quite well all the way out to the edges, the corners of these, these big sensors out to 52 millimeters, which uh, gives about a half a degree by a half a degree field of view. Um, and of course, uh, we get, as you guys know, we get colors from using a color, color filters in a wheel, filter wheel changer. And you can see that on the back of the telescope back here. Uh, I have it sitting on an on a Astrophysics 1600 mount, which is a pretty big mount for this telescope. Uh, but it is absolutely rock solid. You can tap it and nothing moves. It's a very, very solid telescope. It, I used to run it outside of... Uh, my, uh, my hanger here in, in Bend, Oregon. Um, and this is the way it used to look on a little roll out pier that I have. It's not such a little pier. This is actually a massive pier uh, and it's on wheels. And I would just roll it out and use it here. And I got it running here. And then I, I moved it out to uh, DSW in, in Northern New Mexico, just uh, about, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 miles outside of Santa Fe. And it works pretty well. But again, this will serve as our reference system uh, for this 20-inch uh, scope. 
see if I can get system kind of hangs up here. Hang on with me for a second. There we go. <coughs> for those of you who haven't done remote imaging, I stuck this slide in here so you can see what a remote imaging observatory looks like. This is just from one of the, the, observa the, the cameras in the observatory. My scope there is obviously circled in, in red. There are typically 20 to 25 scopes per building. Uh, it's, it's very dark out there. I mean, the Milky Way almost casts a shadow. Uh, it is extremely dark. Um, they, of course, they provide power network, weather reporting, video monitoring, and roof control. Their customers include, you know, private individuals like myself, government and research, research organizations. And in fact, there's a scope here. I think it's this one over here. There's a Celestron that's used by uh, folks who are monitoring Chinese uh, missile launches. And they're looking for, orbit. they're trying to calculate orbital parameters with this particular scope. And they run it with a, uh, a hyperstar system. And it's on every night. <clears throat> so a big question is, you know, why get a bigger scope? Well, the advantages are potentially more signal, better signal to noise ratio, potentially more image detail. And that appeals to me a lot. Um, and potential for a larger field of view. Um, these, some of these larger scopes are, uh, have a faster focal ratio, shorter focal length, and with my sensor could potentially give me a little bit bigger, bigger field. Of course, the downside is all you guys know, these things cost a lot of money. You know, the 20 inch uh, plane wave scopes are about almost five times more expensive than a 14 inch Celestron. And the 24 inches are, you know, almost nine times, a little more than nine times as much as a 14 inch. I mean, they get pretty expensive. And of course, the biggest thing is they're more affected by atmospheric turbulence. And probably one of my biggest uh, kind of issues that I deal with out at DSW is the seeing. And the seeing out there, the median seeing out there, and I don't have a, a study to show this, but I, my sense is the median, median seeing is around two arc seconds. Um, you know, they, they, a lot of these observatories love to tell you the best they've ever had. And you'll hear numbers like one arc second out there. And I have seen one arc second out there, but it's extraordinarily rare. So the site selection is a big deal. And that put me off of buying a big telescope, a bigger telescope rather, for a long time. So ultimately, one of the big issues is first, you know, where are we going to put it? Um, and the optical resolution, as you guys are probably aware of, of all passive earthbound telescopes larger than about 100 millimeters is determined by atmospheric stability. So in order to achieve better resolution than with this 14 inch scope, a larger scope is gonna require a better location. And it's, as I just said, you know, it's the median seeing conditions are what count, not the best single night. Well, I was at a meeting a few years ago and these folks from OBSTEC showed up uh, they have a, they're a remote telescope hosting facility in Chile, about 20 miles south of where the GMT is located in the Atacama Desert. And they showed up and they said, gee, we have, you know, 320, over 320 nights of clear, clear nights a year. I put down 300 nights here on this slide. That's still plenty good enough for me. And they claim the median seeing is about a half arc second, which is really world-class. That's about four times better than what I get in New Mexico. Uh, I've heard reports it can reach 0.1 to even 0.2 uh, arc seconds of seeing. That just seems unbelievable to me. But I have heard credible results that they actually can reach that. And I've heard from users out there that a half arc second and certainly below an arc second is very common. So my initial goal with this telescope was to make sure that it could, per, that whatever, however I configured it, that it should permit at least a half arc second performance. Uh, and Ultimately, I wanted to buy something that at least doubled the collecting area of the telescope, which meant, you know, a 20 inch, you know, making a jump to a 17 inch or a 16 inch from the 14 inch wasn't a big enough jump for me. The 20 inch was the next size up that I would even consider. And ultimately, I decided on the 20 inch and mainly a big part of that was the cost. But the other part of it was, you know, not only does the cost of the bigger telescope get more expensive, but the cost of everything that goes with it and the difficulty of everything goes, goes with it goes up. I mean, if I'd gone to a 24, you know, the weight, the size, the complexity of the whole system really takes a big jump and it's totally doable. But uh, even with this, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to change a lot the way I do a lot of things with this big telescope. 
This is the plane wave system. You know, it's an F6.8 system. So it's got a focal length. It's a little bit shorter than, than what my C14 has. So the, the field will be a little bit wider. Uh, these are no coma, no, no astigmatism, no field curvature. They claim a, cor a well-corrected field over a 52 millimeter image circle, which is just fine for me with me. They have few silica mirrors uh, with low thermal expansion. It's all carbon fiber. Um, and, uh, you know, they claim it's easy to align. And I think it's easier than an RC to align. That's for sure. Central obscuration from this large secondary is pretty big. It's almost 40%. So that's pretty big. Uh, and hi, and I've talked about back working distance are being a really important thing. This says 5.8 inches, but that's with their focuser. It's actually 8.1 inches. And that's a critical number. Uh, and it takes a little bit of digging to get the right number out of those guys, but they, they do put a number up here. And I've, I've explained to them, they need to put that number up for all of their telescopes. And I think they heard me. So hopefully that's going to become a regular thing. Uh, one of the cool things about the 20 inch is that the design is available in uh, uh, in a book and uh, the telescopes, astrographs and eyepieces uh, is, a, is a great book. It's now out of print, unfortunately, but it goes over lots of different telescope designs and the plane wave 20 happens to be in there. So I could stick it into uh, into Oslo and ray trace it. And this is what it looks like. It's got an F3 primary with 2.27 magnification spherical secondary. Uh, you'll notice it does have some vignetting. Uh, these are actually the size of the field correcting lenses. Uh, and uh, so there is some, vi some vignetting in the system, but it produces really nice spot diagrams. And I, you know, we could look at wavefront and all that stuff, but I don't want to go into all of the, 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 the components of understanding this design in this particular talk, but you can see these, the black circle is the size of the airy disk. Uh, in in this um, display of, of spot of geometric spot diagrams, and so on axis it's clearly diffraction limited, even out to 0.7 uh, uh, 7, 70 percent of the field, um, which which goes to the edges of a 52 of a, of a 36 by 36 millimeter sensor. Uh, it's still pretty much diffraction limited. It starts to fall apart a little bit in the corners of a 52 millimeter circle, but still very, very good. And, and with respect to any atmospheric seeing, uh, this will produce pinpoint stars across that 52 millimeter uh, uh, field image circle. Um, and of course, a, little, a quick note on alignment sensitivity. One of the advantages of these telescopes is they have a spherical secondary. So that makes them uh, a little bit easier to align optically. Uh, you know, the mirror spacing mostly increases field uh, astigmatism. The secondary misalignment in any Cassegrain system is indicated by on-axis coma. Um, and you'll also get field aberration, but that's the very first sign you've got uh, a misaligned system. And the spherical secondary in the CDK does make it considerably easier to align than, than say, uh, an equivalent uh, Ritchie Krejcian. Uh, this image came to me from some guy on, I can't remember, I think it was on Astrobin saying, gee, I've got something wrong with my stars. What is this? Well, of course, uh, that's what coma looks like. And if you see this, uh, stars that look like this near the center of your field, uh, you've got a misaligned telescope. So it's a good idea to be able to have some idea of how to, how to look at your star images to get some clue as to how well aligned it is. We all know they're perfectly round. You know, if, this, if the telescope optics are good and it's well aligned, we should see really round, small, uh, precise pinpoint stars. But when we see coma, that's an indication of a, a misaligned uh, secondary. Well, let's talk a little bit about matching the camera to the optics. And, and, and to do that, we're going to review some basics, some very basic radiometry here. And one of the things that's very basic when we talk about extended sources is the camera equation. And the camera equation falls out of uh, basic radiometry. Uh, and, and the basic conclusion of the camera equation is that a faster system always produces more irradiance in the focal plane. And the equation for the, the camera equation is pretty simple, and I've just shown it here as a function of field angle. We know that uh, this is just basically the source radiance, the focal ratio, the, 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 out, the irradiance in the focal plane varies as the inverse square of the focal ratio. And then we had this cosine to the fourth fall off with field angle across the image plane. And a lot of amateurs tend to think, call, call vignetting 
they, they tend to think the image uh, irradiance falls off only because of vignetting, but it, there's actually this radiometric fall off as well. And so the main takeaway is the irradiance for extended optics is proportional to the inverse of the focal ratio squared. And what that means is, functionally, an eight meter F4 telescope produces the same irradiance in an image as an 80 millimeter F4 telescope for any given extended object. You know, that, that's kind of a, a very interesting result. A lot of people don't think about that. The larger image, however, produces a much bigger image. The irradiance is the same, but the image is much, much bigger in a larger telescope. So, you know, that's kind of the first thing that we can see, you know, getting a bigger telescope gives you a bigger image for a given focal ratio. And, um, but we're dealing with the exact same irradiance. The irradiance when we talk about uh, stars is a little bit different and we do the calculation slightly differently. And I'm not gonna go through that, it's a diffraction calculation, but it's proportional to uh, the diameter divided by the focal ratio squared. And I want to point out, in case anybody's, and I know there are a lot of sharp amateurs out there, you will jump, call up my front side and down to my backside over this, is that, you know, that's only true in a vacuum. Once you start introduce uh, atmospheric seeing where things are wiggling around a little bit, that screws things up a little bit, but not by a lot. And the net result of this particular, uh, this particular outcome is that, a bigger aperture almost always re reveals fainter stars. And so, and you can see that in a lot of images. You know, if you look at a telescope of, of the same field uh, with a small telescope versus a large telescope, the large telescope almost always will show lots and lots of stars compared to the smaller telescope. But irradiance in the image plane isn't really what counts. What we really are worried about is the, de the detector signal. And it's the signal that uh, that we're worried about at each pixel. And it's simply the irradiance distribution integrated over the pixel area multiplied by the responsivity of the, of the, the detector that we're using. And if we do the math on that, it turns out that the signal is just equal to R, the responsivity, times the area of the pixel, times the average irradiance over, over each pixel. So signal, remember, is proportional to the area of the detector. And the signal of noise due to photon noise varies as the square root of the responsibility of the responsivity uh, times the number of photons that are incident on that sensor. So the signal varies linearly with the pixel dimensions. And with respect to, to photon noise, the signal to noise ratio always improves with bigger pixels. That's the sort of the conclusion of, of, of all of this. So in general, it's better to have bigger pixels than smaller pixels. Okay, so and and of course when I say this, I'm assuming uh, equal sensitivity, okay, and equal read noise and equal dark noise. So there's a little bit of complexity to that, but in general, what we usually care about in imaging is photon noise. That's the main thing that we care about. Now I know if we're doing lucky imaging and really short exposures, we've got to worry about that read noise, but in for most of us doing long exposure, low light imaging, um, we don't really need to worry about the, the read noise or the dark noise in terms of uh, the, the most desirable, determining the most desirable pixel size. So in general, you know, what works best? You know, if the pixels are too small, then the signal to noise suffers. And if they're too big, the image, image kind of quote unquote, the, the image sharpness suffers, okay? You know if the pixels are too big. If you have one bit big pixel over the entire sensor, you don't see anything. Uh, so we, you know, for, for image sharpness, there's sort of a sense that we want to have small pixels. And I've noticed in a lot of discussions uh, over the years with lots of different folks in, in, in the amateur world that this is a subject that generates endless and sometimes very heated discussions. So let's kind of go over how I view this and how I think it works. And hopefully I can convince you guys that this makes some sense. So let's first talk about how uh, sampling works. And we're gonna talk about something called Nyquist sampling. And I'm gonna kind of wave my hands at this because Nyquist sampling is actually very easy to work out, but it, but it involves knowing some Fourier theory. And I don't wanna go into all that math. And so I'm gonna tell you just some results is that in general, I'm sorry, the, the, the Nyquist theorem states that we need at least two samples 
per cycle at a, any given spatial frequency that is set by the, the, the limit of the optical system uh, in order to perfectly reconstruct the image that is incident on that uh, image plane. If we undersample that, if we have less than two samples per cycle, that results in the loss of high frequency, high spatial frequency information, okay? And that'll cause the image to appear a little blurry. It can also do some things in normal photography, which, which relate to causing aliasing of high frequency information in the image, which results in more effects. If you go out with your camera and photograph the side of a building that has a periodic structure, if you do it just right, you'll see that you'll get a moray pattern uh, for periodic structures. That's not such a big problem for, for astroimaging, but it is one of the effects of undersampling. If we oversample, if we, if we just pick a, uh, a camera that with really, really, really tiny pixels, so, such that we have more than two samples per cycle for the highest spatial frequency made available by the optics, we, we can't recover any additional information. Okay, so remember, this is key. And a lot of folks who are into electronics don't realize this. In an electronic system, we don't necessarily have a bandwidth limited system. However, in optics, we're really lucky because an optical system like a telescope actually has a bandwidth limit. Okay, it cannot pass spatial frequencies higher than that bandwidth limit. So it is a bandwidth limited system. So we can easily tell where that limit is. And if we go beyond two samples per cycle, we don't get any additional information out of the system. Critical sampling is the optimum sample sampling required for perfect image reconstruction. Now, remember the theory requires point samples. And in practice, we're using little rectangular samples. Okay, so it's not really quite right. The theory isn't quite right for what we're doing, however, Finite pixel sampling modifies things in a small but predictable way. And we're gonna, we're gonna see that as I talk about this a little further. So I want you to remember that. We're not quite using exactly Nyquist, but Nyquist is a good starting point to determine how we should sample the image. And an MTF curve, really what it does is it shows how spatial frequencies, and these are what spatial frequencies look like. They're basically sinusoidal intensity patterns. They show, it shows how, for example, this high spatial frequency transmits through the optical system and how its contrast is modified by the optical system, okay? And remember, when we think about the object, it's made up of a combination of different spatial frequencies as determined by Fourier analysis. And again, you know, I'm kind of waving my hands at that. I'm not showing you the math of that because that gets complicated. So, you know, we, in, in amateurs, in, in, in imaging uh, circles, we typically just, you know, we, we talk our way around that. But I just want to emphasize, this is what an MTF curve, an MTF uh, looks like, and it's what the system is doing to the spatial frequency content. And at the highest end, this represents, this point represents the highest spatial frequency transmitted by the optical system, which is in normalized, in, in actual space rather, in, in inverse line pairs per unit distance is one over lambda times the focal ratio. And this is also, it requires 4.88 point samples across the airy disk in order to get to that point right there. So if you wanna learn more about this, this is, by the way, this is a monochromatic MTF. This is not a polychromatic MTF. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about this, I did a, a complete uh, talk on the Astro Imaging channel about MTF. And this is the actual address here, and you can type that in, and it might be hard to, to snag that off of the video or even from this slide. But if you go to Google, go to YouTube and just search M Astro Imaging channel MTF, you can pop up that, that uh, uh, presentation, and that should clear up a lot of that stuff. So just remember the takeaway here is that once you sample at more than 4.88 points across the airy disk, you don't get any information. And here's what it looks like. This would be a sensor array that's sampling that airy disk. And that's what Nyquist sampling looks like at critical sampling uh, interval uh, superimposed on the airy disk. And this is a 2.7 micron sample at F10.8. Again, I've just used the, the Celestron example. 
Um, and by the way, that puts 2.05 samples across this central, the full width half max of this central lobe, which is kind of an interesting result. We'll kind of come back to that later, but about two samples across the central lobe gives you the, uh, the critical sampling interval for an area disk. And as we'll see, this isn't really very useful for ground-based passive telescopes, okay? All you guys know that the atmosphere is out there trying to screw you up all the time when you're taking images. So this, was re this is really relevant stuff for the guys who designed Hubble. But for us, it's not that, that relevant, but it's a good starting point. So let's just talk about um, what we can do here when we, when we uh, sample holding the, uh, when we hold the sampling interval constant in image space. And here, remember, the image irradiance varies directly as one over the focal ratio squared. The pixel area is gonna remain constant. In other words, we're gonna use the same camera and we're just gonna swap it between different imaging systems. So holding the diameter constant and doubling the focal length decreases the irradiance and signal by one fourth, okay? The sampling rate, which is the arc seconds per pixel in the sky, will decrease with increasing focal ratio. And this is basically what happens when you change lenses on a regular camera. So if you have your, your DLSR and you pull the, the one lens off and put on a new lens, this is what you're doing. And what that leads to is this is what it looks like in, in the focal plane. We have the same pixel spacing, but we end up having different airy disk diameters depending on, remember, the focal ratio. Remember, it only depends on the focal ratio. So each pixel here, when we put on a longer focal length uh, lens on our camera, produces, in this case, if we double the focal length, we get one quarter of the signal. So using the same, same camera means that slower systems produce less signal than faster systems. And even folks who work in optics tend to think this way. Okay, if I use a faster system, I get more, more signal. Well, that's only true if you use the same sensor. And so, you know, that's, but not so fast. I mean, ultimately, this is why this is called the focal ratio mish, myth. It's because we're only thinking of using the same camera with different optics. If instead we say, let's look at holding the sampling uh, constant in object space rather than image space. So now a long, slow focal length system can produce the same signal as a fast system if you keep the angular sampling rate the same in object space between two different systems. So here you can see case one, we've got a short focal length system. And here we've got a case two, a long focal length system. Here, the signal is just equal to the irradiance times the responsivity times X squared, which is the size of the pixel dimension. Here, we've doubled the focal length. So what happens? The irradiance goes down, but if we now double the size of the pixels to keep the angular sampling the same, we get exactly the same signal between these two systems. So for constant angular sampling, focal ratio doesn't matter. So it just depends on uh, whether we're holding sampling constant in image space or whether we're holding sampling constant in object space. So in this case, focal ratio is all about field size and it has nothing to do with signal strength if we properly match our camera to the system, okay? So this is what that looks like in the image plane. Here we have uh, a short focal length, an F5 system. Of course, that's gonna give a smaller PSF in the focal plane, but then we're gonna use smaller pixels. Here we match the pixels to the size of the larger PSF in the F10 system with four micron pixels. And here, you know, we've matched this, the detector to the optical system to maintain the same signal strength. So, you know, using that F10.8 system in, uh, out in New Mexico, if it's sampled properly, it's given me the same signal as if I had a really fast system that was properly sampled. And here's an example of that. One of the cool things about the Celestron telescopes that you guys, I'm sure all know about, is the, you know, with the 14 inch, we've got uh, an effective focal ratio of 3850. If we use uh, uh, an F7 reducer, we can get that down to 2456. And if we use a hyperstar system, we can get all the way down to F6.75. So we've got three different uh, focal ratios. And if we use the same camera, then indeed we get 
different amounts of signal. It's the ratio of 32 to one in one case and 13.6 to one in the other case with the F7. Um, so here, guiding uh, requirements decrease if we just use the same camera. If we use three different cameras with the same QA optimally sampled in object space, we have the same exposures, the same guiding uh, requirements, uh, regardless of the, the effect of focal length. So now let's think about seeing, because seeing is really the thing that screws us all up. And it changes a lot of stuff. And as you guys know, that column of air in front of the telescope ca causes this time varying wavefront distortion. And this results in two big effects for really small scopes, you know, in the range of 100 to 130 millimeters. It results in, in mostly star movement, which is tilt in the wavefront. In larger telescopes, once you get above this size, uh, you get tilt plus you get higher order uh, wavefront aberrations that results in, in star size variations due to these higher order wavefronts. So seeing affects these long focal length systems a lot more than short focal length systems. And that's a big deal in going to this 20 inch telescope. And here's kind of a simulation of what it looks like. Here's an instantaneous star image uh, where, you know, I started with a very small area disk and then I aberrated it. And when you take your integrating sensor and you add this all up, you end up with an integrated blur disk that has a Moffat distribution, which is really a modified Lorentzian. And uh, that forms the blur disk that we actually see when we take images of the sky using long exposure imaging. So um, that's what we see. So how does that affect sampling? How can we really model that? Well, remember the MTF in the integrated uh, image shows three things. It shows the whole system frequency response, which is the telescope plus the sensor plus the atmosphere. And the cool thing here is that MTFs, if they're coupled incoherently, you can calculate the MTF of the entire system by taking the MTF of the sensor, multiplying it by the MTF of the optical system, and multiplying that times the MTF of the atmosphere. Okay. So turb the turbulence theory developed by Kolomogorov in the 1940s and Freed in the, the mid 60s makes this a more tractable problem. And I'm not gonna go through all of the math here, but it's really conceptually very simple. Basically what we do is we approximate that integrated star image, which is a Moffat, by a seeing kernel using a Gaussian, okay? And the seeing induced Gaussian kernel has a width of sigma in radians, and it's given by this expression uh, where beta is the stellar full width half max. And basically all you're doing here, and you know this, this is what Kolb Magarov came up with, but you can do it yourself. And I did it before I read his paper. You ba basically just fit, best fit an airy pattern to a Gaussian. And you can set up the boundary conditions uh, such that the seeing blur full width half max is just the, airy full width half max with perfect seeing. That's the boundary condition. So we can use this turbulence theory to predict the full system MTF. And that turns out to be pretty useful for determining how do we couple, how do we best couple a camera to the optical system? And so what I did here was kind of interesting. So first I took that MTF curve and I calculated the MTF for a diffraction limited system that has an obscuration ratio of 39% and at this at an F number of F6.7. And that's this dashed line. That's what the, the 20 inch would look like in space. And then I did something interesting here. Instead of plotting this in what you normally see are normalized units, I said, let's look at this in image space and say, what's the required sampling that's required in the image plane in order to sample each of these spatial frequencies? So to sample this spatial frequency, we need 2.8 samples per micron, okay? Uh, or, or I'm sorry, microns per sample. I said that incorrectly, I apologize. That's how, what's the spacing you need in order to achieve uh, perfectly sample that spatial frequency. Now we can also do that in object space. I don't really care about object space. I just put that in for completeness. But what we can do then is we can say, look, if we were to calculate this just using the obscured perfect system, 
multiply that by the seeing values for, for a half arc second, one arc second, and two arc second. These are the three curves we get. There's the blue one is for a half arc second. This is one arc second, and that's two arc second. And you can see what this seeing does is it causes the frequency response to fall rapidly to zero well before the system does. Okay, so this is what we're gonna see under the atmosphere. So for one arc second seeing, in order to properly sample that, you need a, a pixel spacing that's somewhere in the range of 4.4 to 7.4 microns. I just happened to pick 0.1 as the cutoff. So this shows the range of sampling you need to sample for these three different seeing conditions. And that's just kind of a starting point. So you can see under the best conditions out down in Chile that this system's going to need something in the range of two and a half to four microns. Okay. So let's let's think about that and let's think about what cameras could we pick. Well, I picked a 16803 camera, which has nine, nine microns. And I said, everybody's using that. I use it on my C14. I know it might be undersampled a little bit. Let's go ahead and try it and see how it works. So I stuck one of these on the 20 inch. The other option is a QHY600M. And of course, ASI has one of these cameras too. It's an IMX455 sensor that has 3.76 micron pixels, okay? The QE is higher than, than the FLI, the old CCD, um, but the field of view is a little bit smaller. There's a little bit of a trade-off. And I'm pulling up here a little calculation I did for the folks on cloudy nights. And this looks complicated, but it's really super simple. This is basically showing how to compare signal strengths between two systems of different aperture, different focal ratio, different obscuration, different transmission, different responsivity. Uh, whatever, what have I leave left? Oh, and pixel size and, and pixel size. So this is really a, a very simple equation, even though it's a little bit long and it looks complicated, but what it allows us to do is to compare signal strengths between our reference system and the 20 inch. The, 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 the signal strength we call the 14 inch 100%. If we take the 20 inch and we, we use two by, uh, two by two binning, okay, I'm sorry, and we use, I'm sorry, scratch that. If we use the CCD, um, we get a signal strength of, of almost, 250%, so a lot more signal with the 20 inch. That's fantastic. If we go to CMOS and we plug in all the numbers for CMOS, it looks like if we use um, two by two binning with you know, the equivalent of seven and a half micron pixels, we get almost exactly the same as we do with the nine micron. And if we go to the full native one by one binning, we only get 61% of the signal. So we'd have to use a little bit more exposure to get back, to get our signal to noise ratio back, back. So given that, let's look at what happens now. And this is going to look kind of complicated, but bear with me. Um, we're going to now fold in the MTF of the sensors on top of what we did for the atmosphere and the OTA. So First of all, these light lines show zero atmosphere, zero, and zero detector. The dashed line here shows what we get for the, and in this case, this is the um, plane wave. To, uh, this is the, I'm sorry, this is the Celestron sh right here showing what happens with the nine micron pixels. And what happens? Why does it go to zero here? Well, that's the spatial frequency at which you have a bright and a dark fringe covering one single pixel. What happens to the contrast? It goes to zero right there, okay? So when you multiply the MTF of the sensor times the MTF of the uh, seeing limited OTA, this is what it does to each of those three seeing conditions. And we can do that for the Celestron here. We can do it for the 20 inch with the 455, uh, both binned and unbinned. And we can see that as we go to the smaller pixels, okay, we begin to move this response further out. And with, with, if we use it one by one binning, we move the resp response quite far out under half arc second condition. It makes a big difference. And if we were to compare this, I'm sorry. So I, I said it wrong. This is the 20 inch with um, the nine micron pixels. I, I apologize. I, I originally said that was the Celestron. This is the nine micron pixels on the 20 inch. This is the, the CMOS camera on the 20 inch. So these are all 20 inch results. 
And if we go down to the next one and compare, what do we get from the edge system compared to the plane wave with the same camera? Look what happens. The frequency response on the plane on the plane wave, the bigger telescope, is worse than it is on the 20 inch under good seeing conditions. If you actually sit here and study this a little bit, under bad seeing conditions, well, under one and two arc second seeing conditions, the difference is almost nothing. But when you start looking at using really small pixels, okay, it's it you get a worse result with the plane wave 20 than you do with the, the edge 14. If you go to the plane wave 20 and you say, all right, let's put the, uh, the IMX 455 on there and let's use it with the it one by one binning, boy, things get a lot better. So the conclusion here is no matter what, and we all know this, better seeing always helps, even a little bit. We know that. That's not a surprise, but those charts show that. Um, with the nine micron pixels, the 20 inch will not produce a better image quality than the 14 inch. Okay. And in excellent conditions, it actually performs worse. So sending a 20 inch to Chile, uh, will get sharper images with nine micron pick to, to get sharper images with nine micron pixels is a waste of money. I mean, I might as well send the, the 14 inch there. Okay. So, uh, the 20 inch does provide a stronger signal and a wider field. That's cool. That's a real benefit. That's a true benefit of the 20 inch, but you don't need to send it to Chile to get that benefit. I might as well send it to SRO or somewhere else. Small pixels only increase image information under good seeing conditions. And you guys know this, I mean, but I see people do it all the time. And I see people talking about it all the time. Just use the smallest pixels you can use, dump the, the smallest key, pixels you can dump on your, your telescope and it'll all be fine. Well, under poor conditions, small pixels only decrease signal and noise. That's all they do for you. They don't give you any more information. Okay, so that's a really big takeaway. So remember, you know, if you're dumping one of these new CMOS cameras on a F10 telescope under say two arc second conditions, you're making your life harder as an imager. Okay, and then I asked the question with this system, what would it take to get 100% signal out of this 20 inch compared to the 14 inch that I'm used to? Well, that would require 4.8 micron pixels. That would be to me ideal. I'd have the same signal. I'd get better MTF response. I mean, to me, that'd be a great solution, but that sensor isn't available. So, but that's a big takeaway from doing the MTF analysis, okay? Let's talk about how we're gonna guide in the line here. And I better hurry up because we got a lot to talk about. Um, active guiding, you guys know all about that. Half arc second in this case is a diamond, almost four and a half miles, 4.6 miles. That's not trivial. Um, I'm not gonna talk to you guys a lot about guiding because if you're imagers, you know about that. Um, you, you also know about single star guiding versus multiple star guiding. Just before we started, we talked a little bit about auto covariance, full frame guiding, and that's what I'm gonna be using on the system. And we're just starting to test that right now. Up until now, I've been doing single star guiding and I get very good performance out of the system using single star guiding. I also do on axis guiding using ONAG. This is on axis uh, guiding. And just very briefly to, re to review that, this is the way on-axis guiding works. We have a dichroic beam splitter. Uh, it reflects, it transmits rather, any uh, light that's above seven, uh, let me see if I said, above 700 nanometers wavelength to uh, a, 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 an auto guiding sensor. It's actually 750 nanometers, I goofed. All the visible light uh, below that wavelength goes up to our imaging sensor. And back here, our auto guide sensor uh, is imaging in the near infrared. And um, we, get, we can look at the same object that we're guiding off of, if we, it, that we're imaging, if we want to using this arrangement. And it works extremely well. Um, it's always easy to find bright guide stars using this technique. Uh, I, I mean, I very rarely struggle to find guide stars. That's extremely rare. Um, it's slightly less susceptible to seeing effects. I won't go into all of that, but the Kolmogorov theory talks a little bit about that. There is a wavelength dependence. So longer wavelengths are a little easier to guide with. Um, you can guide on the same object you're being, that you're imaging. It does require a high quality beam splitter. And that turns out to be um, a little bit sticky, although you only use a very small part of the beam splitter. 
uh, when you use this uh, for each star. So that turns out to not be a hard requirement to meet, but it is a consideration for the guy who makes it, namely Gaston over at IFI. And he's good at, at, at handling that. The real bonus here is that ONAG can provide a focus signal. And that's because a converging beam, <coughs> excuse me, through a window produces astigmatism. And this is the exact same autofocus system that's used in DVD players. It's been used for years. Uh, you do have two cameras, the guide camera and the imaging camera. They do have to be very carefully co-focused, but that is a very, very simple um, uh, uh, system, a uh, very simple uh, condition to meet uh, with very simple align, uh, alignment, pre-alignment. And it's only one time. You just do it once. And the beauty of this is I get continuous autofocus that runs in real time with the shutter open. Now, this is most relevant when you have a system that is very has a very high thermal sensitivity. These plane waves do have some thermal sensitivity. I've seen that. They are not as sensitive as the C14. Uh, a lot of people believe that they're rock solid. You don't ever have to refocus them. And that's only true when the temperature is pretty stable. Uh, they do change, and it depends on your environment. They are less sensitive, but I do want to emphasize they are not completely insensitive. And so this business of holding focus continuously all night long is really a bonus. And by the way, this improves your throughput considerably. You don't have to stop and take a whole bunch of images, compute a V curve, move things around a lot, and then restart your exposure. Uh, this continuously focuses as you guide, and it's super easy to use. By the way, this is just a quick model that I did showing the geometric um, model of the spot diagrams through an ONAG. This is just pure astigmatism. This is an actual measurement. This is actually, I bench tested the C14 looking at what the astigmatism looks like through focus. And by the way, you get both magnitude and direction out of this technique. And the sensitivity is, is very high. The sensitivity is constant through focus. I said linear, that's not quite right. It's constant through focus. Unlike V-curve focusing, which goes to lower sensitivity as you go through focus. This is, this is constant through focus, and you get about plus or minus a tenth wave of sensitivity, which is more than sufficient to produce seeing limited focusing. I, I like to say diffraction limited focusing, but it's generally limited by seeing. So I'm a huge proponent of ONAG. This is what it looks like on the 14 inch. There is the ONAG right there. And of course, the imaging camera the filter wheel, the guide camera. Um, the uh, telescope is on a, an L-series mount, which requires uh, precision balance at all times. So I have this on a rotator, but the rotator has to be count counterbalanced to make sure that we have good uh, axial uh, balance on the uh, mount when it runs. Let's talk about testing this stuff. How do we test all this before it gets shipped to Chile? I'll try and hurry it up here. I don't want to keep you guys all night. It's big, it's heavy. How do we do this? Uh, a lot of guys, by the way, just buy the scope and they ship it to Chile and they have the guys down there set it up. And that works a lot of times. But when it doesn't work, it is a nightmare. And I'm aware of at least one guy, and there are probably more than one guys, who spent a year trying to debug their telescope via over 7,000 miles of distance, trying to get it to work and then ultimately having to ship it back to the factory. It's a nightmare. So I'm not willing to do that. Murphy just you know, that's a bad idea. So the first thing I did, the guys at Plane Wave were very nice to me. Uh, in my former life, um, I worked in optical testing. Um, and, you know, we supplied all the equipment that tested uh, James Webb. Uh, this is the exact same instrument that tested all the optics from James Webb. And the guys at Plane Wave set me up so that I could, uh, I could borrow one of these things. This is, you know, a very expensive thing. This, this instrument's $150,000. So this isn't something the average amateur can do. But I could grab uh, really, really good data. I could show it's diffraction limited. Uh, the diffraction, uh, the Strel ratio is about 0.85 on this. It's not very smooth. That bothered me a little bit. Uh, and the biggest problems are right at the edge. And I could talk at great length about why that is. I know why that's happening. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that. But you know, my, my thing about this, and I want to urge you guys, if you're, if you're going to set up in a, a remote observatory, be sure you test it before you send it to, to a remote observatory. It's a nightmare fixing things in the field. The second thing is, how am I going to mount it? This L-series mount for these plane wave scopes comes, and it, they stop right here at the base of this thing, and it's completely out of balance. It, it requires putting it on a pier. So I built a rollout rig for this thing out of aluminum. I just signed, signed on to 
AutoCAD and designed this thing, bought all the parts and built it. And uh, by golly, it works like a champ. I'm just delighted with the way it works. It's rock solid. Uh, the whole scope, by the way, weighs about 700 pounds. Um, I almost rolled it over my foot one day and I can confirm <laughs> it really does weigh about that much. I mean, it, it, it scared me when I almost put it over my foot. Um, the electronic system, I'm not going to go into, but there is a big plan here for running this thing remotely. The key, the key issues or the key things that allow it to be remote, remotely operated are number one, an IP power switch that allows you to turn on and off various components over the internet. And the second thing, of course, is uh, screen sharing on your PC. Those are the two critical things, and I'm sure a lot of you guys use that stuff. So it shouldn't be any mystery, but this thing is all packaged up. It's all connectorized. You can just plug it in and unplug it in seconds. I got it out under the stars. This is a six minute unguided exposure uh, with the scope. And I zoomed in and gosh, I saw the expected diffraction pattern. And right away I saw diffraction patterns at 45 degrees and scratched my head and thought that isn't good. And then I saw some pretty dark corners here and I thought that doesn't look good either. Uh oh. Well, the spikes were easy. I could easily identify that. It's just I use a shroud and in a remote observatory, the shroud is almost essential to keep dirt out of the system. And so this, these shrouds pull around the truss structure and they create, uh, they actually impinge on the marginal rays at the edge of the field. And that's what cre is creating this diffraction pattern. And I immediately went, uh oh, that's no good. It turns out <laughs> Planeway has been selling this for a long time. And I think I'm, the, I, as far as I know, I'm the first guy who ever noticed that there's a problem with this shroud. Uh, so what I did, I solved it in kind of a nice way. I 3, 3D printed some, so a little thing that just clips onto the, onto the structure and holds the shroud out of the way. And that works like gangbusters. Uh, I think I showed it to Plane Wave and they talked about offering something like this. I don't know. I told them I'd give them my design, but uh, I, <laughs> I don't know if they'll ever do it. But uh, it's an easy problem to solve. Um, and it's, it's nice to get rid of those stray diffraction patterns. Uh, one of the problems that we have here um, with those dark corners is that calibration, as you guys know, uh, corrects for three multiplicative effects in the signal. Um, cosine to the fourth, which we talked about, vignetting, which is due to edges, dust, and surface digs, and PRNU, which is the photo response non-uniform uh, non across the sensor. That's probably uh, one, of the, one of the three most important things that you're correcting for in your camera. A lot of guys don't seem to realize that, but that's a very important thing. And it's variations in responsivity between the pixels. And it looks like a spatial noise that's proportional to the signal strength. So flats are really critical. So when I, you know, this is the math for flats. I think you guys know that when it's properly done, you have a start with a raw signal, dark, dark edges, and, and it corrects properly. You guys are imagers, you know what that looks like. When I did that with the 20 inch, uh oh, big troubles. We had big, bright edges. And there are two key reasons that calibration fails. Number one is flat calibration does not correct for additive signals such as stray light, okay? And the flat calibration accuracy decreases with increasing vignetting. It cannot work with 100% vignetting. And we'll come back to that in just a second. My first thought was, where's the stray light coming from? And I looked in the backside and sure enough, I could see right around the baffles in this system. Plus I could see lots of veiling glare. From, from the inside of the baffle system. The guys at Plane Wave at this point were getting a little tired of hearing from me, but I called them up and told them about the problem and they were, they were great. They admitted immediately, yeah, we got a problem with the baffles. So they immediately designed a new set of baffles for me. I, I sent them to me, I installed them and there's what we got. Beautiful, nice, beautifully baffled system. And by the way, for those of you who might wanna buy a 20 inch, the new baffles are what they're selling now. So you won't get the old baffles, you'll get the new ones. So um, that, that was great. I went back and looked at it, that didn't fix the problem. So I went back and started looking at the design of the ONAG. And at first, you know, I just thought it'll work just the way it does with the 14 inch. And even as an engineer, I gotta admit, I screwed it up because I drew this diagram and I said, yeah, we'll get a little vignetting here and there, but no problem. What I didn't account for are the corners. I looked at the side view. I didn't think of the corners. Well, once I started doing the vignetting and looking at the corners, I was cutting out close to 50% at the corners. And that doesn't account for the optical vignetting and a few other effects. So the corners are very heavily vignetting, vignetted. And Gaston was nice enough to share his design with me. And I redesigned one of his parts. And I was able to rebuild a new part 
that, that takes care of this problem. It does require remounting the system, but it'll work on any of the plane waves or any fast system for that matter, up to about F6.8, maybe a little faster. But this is the newly built parts that I made showing the mounting parts for each side of this thing for the ONEG. And the cool thing about this is it doesn't change the external dimensions at all. And that's what it looks like when it's all put together and aligned. And Gaston was just wonderful about this. He helped me and uh, he helped realign this thing and put it together. And bingo, work like a champ. You can see uh, once I fixed that, uh, the vignetting problem, as well as the stray light problem, we went from, and by the way, this is very heavily stretched. Uh, you know, we get a nicely calibrated uh, result. And um, if you ask me how much vignetting is too much, that is still a mystery. I, I can't exact, I wish I could analytically solve this or model it in some way. I know there's a way to do it, but this is a hard problem. And uh, I don't really, I can't tell you guys how much is too much. I can tell you that if you've got more than 50% vignette in your system, excuse me, uh, you're probably going to have trouble. And I see it all the time on AstroVent. I used to see it on cloudy nights. It, this is a problem that a lot of people run into. So the very first thing when you get, you know, bad, bad vignetting results, you know, A, it's stray light is the first question. The second question is how much vignetting you have, do you have? If it's more than 50%, you're likely, you've likely got troubles. My own advice is to keep it below 25 to 30% um, at the most. Um, so uh, how do we evaluate the under the sky performance? And we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to rush, kind of rush through this. But really what I wanted to know is how well does this thing work with all this stuff in the beam? And, uh, you know, secondary alignment, all that stuff. How do we do this? Because, I, you know, I already uh, measured this thing with a $150,000 interferometer and probably, a, geez, a half million dollar flat and a lot of expense but I still don't know how it works all put together, okay? We could do this with a Hartman test or a Shack Hartman. We could use a point diffraction interferometer. We could use Ronke, knife edge, all kinds of stuff. These are only qualitative. All that stuff costs money. And Gaston came to me with an idea quite a while ago, and he and I have been talking about this for a long time. And, and I have to give him a lot of credit for this, but he and I kind of worked on this together. We ended up writing a paper about it for SPIE. But it's basically a way to use to 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 quantify star testing, and the basic idea is to generate some uh, appropriate some random uh, use a random number generator to to generate some uh, Zernike components that can model a wavefront, and then we appetize that according to what we have in the telescope, and we generate a monochromatic defocused PSF. And then we normalize it and we compensate for coherence, which involves what filter we're using and that sort of thing. And then we load uh, an N by N, a neural network database with N by N pixel images. And in this case, we're using about 600,000 of these things. So it's a huge amount of data. We put it into a training loop and we have a figure of merit and we train the uh, neural net, the, the AI system to recognize um, <clears throat> defocus star images. And when it recognizes the defocus star images, it just pulls up which Zernikes were, what, were, were involved in producing that image. And we can then compute a wavefront, okay, which is pretty cool. So we tried it and um, we did this on the bench. And these were the first results we did in the field uh, on the 20 inch. And uh, these are, this is a raw image and this is an intrafocal image. This is an extrafocal image using, as I recall, a red filter. And we ran it through the AI system. And there are the artificial images that we got from the AI system. And I, you know, I, I present that and say to you, those look pretty close. <laughs> it did, that AI system did an amazing job of finding uh, an appropriately matched defocused star image. And the Zernikes that went into that, if you then go backwards and compute the wavefront from which you can compute the peak to valley, the RMS and the strel. And then we go back and compare that to the phase cam data. Now remember, this is a single image actually under the sky with turbulence. And look at this, this it, it correctly identified a little bit of trefoil. Unfortunately, our color scales are not the same, so forgive me. But you can see there's a lot of problem toward the edge on this thing. As you can see here, there's a lot of problem toward the edge. The most relevant numbers are the RMS here on the interferometer was 0 0.065 waves. 
Here we came up with 0 0.075, 0, 0, 0.07 waves. It's only five milliwaves difference. The Stro was 0 0.848 versus 0.81. That's a pretty close result. So this, this, and again, that was a single image. I think if we had averaged this and really worked hard, we might get something where I could wave my hands and say, gee, this is really, really good. But gee, a single image, it worked pretty well. So this is a very cool thing. This will be the basis of what Gaston will be offering to the amateur community for doing optical alignment. Uh, because this system can very easily detect the aberrations that are involved when you misalign a two mirror system. So, um, and it's very sensitive. So for, in particular, those of us who do DSO imaging, uh, this is a great tool. I think the planetary guys will just love this, I think, because they're always tweaking alignment and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, that's a very interesting result. Uh, you know, and it can be used simultaneously to image multiple stars over the field so we can look at um, uh, field performance um, and all kinds of stuff. We, and so, you know, I'll just give you that. It, I think it's going to be a cool thing. Uh, and finally, I did get an image out of the 20 inch. There it is just from my driveway here in Bend before it goes down to Chile. We'll have it shipped in another, oh gosh, another uh, month or so here. So in terms of imaging, we'll just wrap it up. I mean, rule number one, and maybe you guys already know this. I mean, nothing is easy, <laughs> at least as easy as you think it's going to be. Um, and I don't care how much optics you know. I don't care how long you've done this. Uh, there's always something. And Second, you know, always verify the performance. Unexpected results are not uncommon. And engineering in the real, real world is almost never a linear process. It often takes more than one design to get it right. I mean, I, I hate to say it, you know, I screwed up that business with the vignetting, but that happens. Um, so remember the, the basics. When you don't understand something, stop and figure out what's going on and pay attention to the details. That whole little uh, shroud thing you know, that that was a little minor thing that I just happened to notice. And maybe somebody else has noticed it too, but I haven't heard from anybody who noticed it. But a lot of people have said, gee, I've noticed that thing, but I had no idea what it was. Murphy is relentless. And his ability to, to screw things up goes on and on. Uh, and, I, you know, I do have to say that you have to balance the urge to overanalyze something against trying it to just see how it works, you know, but relative to cost and money. And you know, if you're building a, you know, a $2 billion telescope, like the GMT, you need a lot of analysis. But if you're building a 20 inch, you know, a little 20 inch telescope that's going to go down to Chile, sometimes just trying it, you know, is, is a quicker and easier way to do it. But having good problem solving skills is a big part of this whole thing. So I'll stop there. I apologize. I went just a little bit over, but uh, that's pretty much the story of this 20 inch telescope for you guys. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Pretty sure I have that uh, shroud problem, <laughs> so that's a that's a big tip. Yeah, take a look take a look up close at your star images in the cor near the corners, particularly the bright star images, and you'll you'll find those little forty five degree uh, diffraction. If you've got a shroud on it, I'm pretty sure you've got that problem. <laughs> cool. So uh, well, let's start out with Bruce's question. Bruce, since you're there, why don't, instead of on, on chat, why don't you uh, just add? Oh, okay. Um, I was just wondering, you had mentioned that there's uh, little to be gained by oversampling, but I, I have come across uh, people saying that um, oversampling can be valuable if you're deconvoluting. And I'm wondering if, that, if that's a myth or if that's reality. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a myth. That's a myth. Uh, you know, the deconvolution process um, <clears throat> is not quite the same as, as information recovery. Um, but uh, the deconvolution, pro I mean, unless you've got really, really, you're, unless you're, you know, just seriously undersampled, um, in general, the deconvolution process, you know, once you, you, you apply the deconvolution process typically after you've stacked, and that will typically tend to uh kind of fix a severe under undersampling problem but uh oversampling is is not the appropriate response to trying to get better deconvolution thanks yeah 
I've either baffled you guys completely <laughs> or I explained it really well. I'm not, I can ask not, some questions. Not quite sure. Not quite sure what somebody you else, uh, I mean, if anybody else has questions, please jump in. Otherwise, in five well, seconds. I don't know if it's, it, well, I guess it's a question. So you said there's no 4.8, was it, micron pixel cameras? Well, you, you know, the, the real problem, Glenn, is uh, it's not so, there may be some 4.8s. And in fact, I right, right now I've got, I'm using a 5.2 or something on a refractor. The problem is I want to use a big sensor. Okay. And so, you know, the problem is a little bit more constrained than I, than I meant to imply there. You know, I want a big sensor uh, and I want to get something that's, you know, maybe 4.8-ish. Uh, that would be kind of ideal. I mean, if there was a 36 by 36 millimeter CMOS with 4.8 uh, or or 2.4 that I could yeah. bend to 4.8. Uh, again, you have a bandwidth problem for these remote scopes, and even with this uh, this IX you know 455 sensor, gosh, you know each each image one by one bend is 130 megabit megabytes, um, and you know when you're transferring all that stuff over the internet from Chile. And you've taken, you know, say, I don't know, 40 images in a night or whatever it happens to be on a long night, 30 images. That's a lot of data. And so, you know, that becomes a consideration as well. Um, yeah, well, a couple of us have just purchased a, a sensor with the IMX 492. So it has the 2.3 micron pixels that would normally we would bend to 4.63. Oh, that's microns. Nice. That's not how big is the sensor? That's a four thirds sensor. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, the small. Yeah. 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 So, you know, that's, I mean, that's a nice, nice size to bend to for sure. Uh, so, you know, for, for F6.5. And again, I, you know, I have to be a little careful here, you know, with this large aperture system. Um, you know, the seeing effects are, are always more severe, you know, depending on what scope you put that on. I mean, that's, that should be a really nice sensor. What is that, Glenn? That's the uh, ASI 294 mono. The, the naming is a little confusing because um, you might think that's the Sony 294 sensor, but the monochrome is actually the 492 sensor. Um, so it's more sensitive than an ASI 1600 and uh, it's 14 bits instead of 12 bits and, and uh, um, back illuminated and there's a number of better things about it. Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds great. And it's 14 bits only when binned because uh, they, they, they combine four pixels into one. Uh, oh, it's only 14 bits when it's two by two bin. Is that what I It's a 12 bits in the bin one. Oh, in bin one. What is it when you when you bin two? When you bin two is uh, 14 bits. It is still for okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, awesome. Anything else you guys sure. want to talk about? What's that? Was there somebody else? Okay, I'll jump in. Um, you know, let's say you're not sending a telescope down to Chile. Sure. <laughs> say you're imaging from the Bay Area or a dark place near the Bay Area. How, how would your uh, recommendation, you know, I assume your setup is way overkill for uh, situations like that, where, you know, with seeing issues with some light, you know, you know, anyway, you get the idea. Well, well, the advantage of this system, you know, in your area is that it gathers signal pretty fast. I mean, that's probably the biggest advantage over the 14 inch is uh, even with an appropriately sized, you know, I would always bend this thing. You know, if I was putting this thing out at DSW, I would never, I might put the same sensor on it at 7.4. I might even run it with a 16803, but I would never run it with the small pixels. And in that case, it gathers signal pretty darn fast compared to the 14 inch. So, you know, that's that's an advantage of the 20 inch. But but the you know, the limitation there is you don't get any more image detail. And 
I'm kind of fascinated by image detail. You know, I see Adam Block's pictures, you know, that he takes up on Mount Lemmon with that 32 inch uh, up there. And, you know, he's got one arc second imaging uh, up there. And, you know, he gets, you know, that big telescope gets some pretty nice detail. And I really like the detail in these, in these images. So that's a part of my goal. And that's, that's, you know, maybe a little bit different than, than the kind of goal you'd have to have if you were using it there. And by the way, that's why I didn't want to buy a 20 inch for a long time or a bigger telescope, you know, cause it just wouldn't make much difference out at, out at DSW. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the DSW area that you, yeah. you mentioned, it was about 25 or 30 miles outside of Santa Fe. Uh, they get a lot of monsoon weather for at least a few months. And how, how much That's of right. your year is affected by that? And how do you deal with that? And the, yeah. the humidity, I, I, I've heard that DSW sometimes, uh, you know, if the humidity is over 65 or 70 percent, they may shut the roof. I'm not sure exactly yeah. what the, the yeah. number was, but. Yeah, so as for location, uh, I mean, that's a really good question, Bruce. Uh, as for location, if you, if you look at uh, Santa Fe and draw a line to, to, uh, New uh, to Las Vegas, New Mexico, uh, and then you drop down about from that line, you drop down maybe 40 miles to the south, right from the middle. That's about where the observatory is. It's out on something called the Rowe Plateau. It's at about 7,200 feet or so. Uh, it's a little over 7,000 feet. Um, but you're right. There are a lot of issues out there. Um, when it's good, it's very good. I mean, it's, it, as I said, it's very, very dark out there. The sky is just spectacular out there. You get a little bit of a light dome from Albuquerque and a you know, recently growing light dome from Santa Fe. But again, they're, they're pretty dim and they're pretty low on the horizon. Um, but as you say, there are issues. Um, you know, during the winter when the humidity, and they have fog out there, uh, it does, uh, it does snow out there. Um, there are times when the humidity is high and they shut the roof. They're very cautious to protect the equipment. And, you know, that's a good thing. So, um, you know, they want to they want to make sure that the telescopes are protected and humidity is one of their parameters. Obviously, if rain is another parameter, uh, they're very good about keeping that roof closed um, because they realize that there's, you know, there's a liability in keeping that roof closed. And they've, you know, they they are dedicated to trying to protect your equipment. Um, but during the monsoons, you know, e each year is a little different. This year is disastrous. I mean, it is absolutely disastrous. I've been shut down for over two months. I mean, I have to go back and look exactly when I stopped imaging. I think I've had one night of imaging this summer. Um, it, the monsoons have been particularly strong this year, all the way from Tucson, where it's just flooding like crazy up into New Mexico. Um, and it, it can be just a mess there. I got caught in a rainstorm there at DSW one time and the mud is epic. And the owner warned me, the mud is really epic around here. <laughs> I didn't really believe him until I got stuck in the mud and I had to get a tow truck all the way out there. I had a car stuck. I was, you know, I was sinking in the mud myself and it was, <laughs> it was horrifying. Um, so it can be challenging out there. And Again, as I said, when I opened up, you know, the conditions can be very good out there, but the median conditions are not sufficient to support a 20 inch. Now, I would say, I mean, it's an excellent place for, for smaller refractors. Uh, the 14 inch works really well out there. I've gotten some great images out there, but you know, there are a lot of nights where the seeing, the seeing monitor is showing, you know, 1.2 arc seconds and I can see my guide star, you know, I'm getting probably 2.5 arc seconds full width half max. It's, it is nowhere near what the seeing monitor is showing. Um, when it's good, I know it. I mean, I see the guide performance goes down below 0.2 arc se seconds RMS and, you know, the stars are absolutely, I mean, I can measure it on the fly and I see 1.4 arc second full width half max. I know when it's good. Uh, and it's not good that often, you know, I mean, for the 14 inch, you know, for smaller scopes, it's no problem. But I would not put a 20 inch out there. Uh, their prices are reasonable. The people are just great. I mean, they're they're fantastic. The facility is very good, uh, but the conditions, you know, they they they're kind of all over the map. So I, I mean, I don't want to discourage anybody from going to DSW. I mean, I think DSW is is fine. I was actually wondering more about not necessarily DSW, but the the area in general because hot topic is always where should I uh, retire and you know uh, where where am I thinking of putting up uh, a permanent observatory and uh, you know I know the conditions there can be fantastic but 
Boy, that's a tough, that you, you're asking. You're actually asking two different questions there. Uh, <laughs> where you should retire and where you should put a telescope are not necessarily in the same place. <laughs> True. Uh, so yeah, I can talk to you at length about. I'm a retired guy. I can talk to you at length about that. But uh, I, you know, you need to be a little careful about that. You you can end up in a great place for your telescope and have a miserable retirement. <laughs> you have to be a little careful. I love Santa Fe. I love that area of New, New Mexico. Um, but, uh, uh, and, you know, by the way, I mean, SR, SRO has, has its own issues. I mean, every remote observatory has its own issues. I, you know, there, it, it's just normal. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, in a year I'll be back telling you about the issues down in Chile, uh, where, you know, I've, you know, it's, I'm going to find out they have issues too. <clears throat> Nothing's perfect. That's for sure. <laughs> hey, can I, uh, ask you about your, uh, F number fallacy? Yeah, yeah. Back to the technical part. I wanted to, here's the way I have been thinking about it. So tell me if I'm thinking about this right or wrong. Sure. So assume you have a, uh, a target that fits in, you know, your four inch refactor or your, you know, 16 inch reflector, whatever they, the target fits in both. So I would think that the number of photons from that target hitting your imager goes as the area, you know, ratios between the two optical systems. That is, that is absolutely, that part is true. Yes. So, so, you know, given that you optimize the, you know, the pixel cadence, you know, properly, there's just no question, you know, it, it, it doesn't depend on F ratio is what I'm trying to say. It depends on aperture area and getting your camera sensor sampled right. That's the way I've been thinking about it. Yeah, so, so first, hi, let me just say you're not alone in that, in that thinking about it that way. Uh, but I would also tell you that doesn't quite tell you the whole story. You are gathering more photons, but what really counts is the photon, number of photons per unit area. That's what determines ultimately the irradiance value. And that we measure that in units of watts per square meter, okay? So it's, it's how much uh, power are you dumping on the sensor per uh, unit area? And so that larger, even though those two telescopes may have, for example, let's just start off by saying they have the same um, uh, focal length, okay? So, so as you said, the image scale is the same. The larger reflector, okay, will be a faster system, and it will not spread the photons over such a big area, uh, such a big area compared to the smaller telescope with the much longer focal length and much slower. So what you're really worried about is not just how many photons you're gathering, but it's the area that they're spread over, okay, and that determines irradiance. But the thing to remember is that the signal then is determined by how many photons really you're intercepting by the sensor itself. Okay. Right. And that that oh, no. translates into Agreed. signal times that's of response. Meant, that's why I meant that they both capture the target. So like if you, right. you would think that you could normalize the pixels, you know, instead of thinking of irradiance as per, per meter squared, you could think of it as per pixel, you know, watts per pixel. And, and you, you should be able to, you know, adjust the sensor such that the larger, you know, assuming you can buy such a sensor, uh, such that the larger aperture always dominates the smaller aperture, you know, whatever focal length, because the, you know, watts per pixel should always be able to be optimized better with the larger yeah. aperture. So, so I hear what you're saying. I, 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 and I understand how you're trying to cast the problem, but let me suggest that it's much easier to kind of divide the problem into two parts. The first part is what is the irradiance in the image plane? You know, what, what really is the irradiance? And the irradiance, we always measure that in watts per meter. And a faster system always produces higher watts per square meter than a slower system. So we know that, right? Uh, but the signal itself it is deter determines, uh, is the important thing. 
And that's determined by how we divide up that watts per meter. So you're right, but um, the focal ratio myth is that a fast system is always better than a slow system. Well, that's true in irradiance, okay? That's true when you talk about the raw irradiance in the image plane, but that's not true when you talk about the signal that actually comes out of the sensor. Maybe that's the way to, yeah. to say No, that. I mean, I was saying that, makes that F number isn't important. So I'm agreeing with you that the right. F number is not, you know, dominating. What I'm right. saying is aperture, given that you match the sensor right, I think that's, that was the point in your talk. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. I just, I, I tend to shy away from the notion that, and it's a true notion, it's absolutely true that the bigger telescopes gathering more photons, that's absolutely true. But, but the, the, I tend to shy away from starting at that point because I find that it gets, it confuses the issue because really what really counts is how are all those photons spread out in the image plane? That's what ultimately counts in terms of irradiance. All right. Are there other questions? All right. Well, I suppose this would be a good good uh, place to thank John then, and it can you know, unmute and clap and all that good. Well, stuff. that's fine. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you guys, and and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It's been great. Hopefully, we'll see you again, maybe at some meeting, uh, maybe AIC in this fall. This fall, it, uh, hopefully they'll hold the meeting. But I'll be at AIC if they hold the meeting. Didn't they move it to twenty twenty two already? I think they did. You're right. They did. I think they did. I think they moved it to 2022 already. So, so all right. So 2022, <laughs> we'll see you guys. I forgot about that. You're absolutely right. Worldwide advanced imaging conference that was held every hundred years in San Jose. Yeah, we can hear you, uh, Francesco. But <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> good information. <laughs> good. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Okay. My pleasure. We'll say goodbye and I'm going to head on out. Have a good evening, guys. Good evening. Thank you.